live. Uh, good morning. This is uh, Sandy Paritzman from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the folks at the symposium on Focus Ultrasound for inviting me to moderate the session. And of course, thank the presenters for not only the efforts of the work, but taking the time to field questions from uh, the rest of the world. Uh, the first abstract uh, is the MRI-guided Tulsa in men with localized prostate cancer, the TAC trial. Uh, we have Dr. Aurora. Uh, this technology was of particular interest to me as I followed it throughout the clinical trial. And uh, in my practice, I've been using a Sonoblate device for about 16 years. So I was always interested uh, in the differences between them. The first question I had had to do with in the study, the reference that some of the outcomes uh, were influenced by the presence of intraprostatic calcifications. And since this energy is being delivered from the urethra outward through the transitional zone and then into the peripheral zone, if you could just fill us in on what criteria you have in advance to perhaps deem somebody not treatable by this technology, if you use transurethra suction to remove calcifications so that they can continue on with the Tulsa, and if there's any pretreatment terps, does that influence or limit the use of this technology? Uh, so yeah, thank you for the question. And as we all know that calcifications are not good and there are a lot of uh, calcifications which occur in the pseudo capsule. Um, so uh, the inclusion criteria for the trial was one, uh, the thickness of the, the size of the calcification was one centimeter. But as the trial went along, we thought we saw that even smaller calcifications um, were um, uh, were problematic, and especially if we could see the cancer or the pirates five lesion just beyond the calcification, uh, I kind of tried to avoid the uh, th those patients. Uh, there are um, uh, there are currently um, so the ultrasound can travel. Uh, through the calcification, but it's not as controllable um, as uh, without the calcification. And the MR thermometry doesn't really work with calcification. So um, there are areas uh, like you can position the introducer in such a way that um, the center of the ultrasound is around uh, the calcification. It's a little bit above or a little bit below. So people have tried that to uh, do that. It should work with um, TERP patients, um, but uh, there are not that many patients with TERP who have had this technology for me to make a definitive um, uh, statement in that regard. Uh, there shouldn't be, a, um, because it's just, uh, so the only thing around the urethra is gonna be the uh, urine or water. So there shouldn't be any um, thing which is stopping the ultrasound beam in TERP patients. So theoretically it works and some patients with TERP have had this, um, but again, there are not enough of them for me to make a uh, definitive uh, thing. And also uh, calcifications, uh, the general sequences we use uh, in MRI for visualization, they also don't work very well on the size and amount of calcification. So you can use different, cal um, different sequences uh, to visualize calcification under MRI, but for um, the current patients, um, uh, after the initial uh, cohort of patients, uh, the one centimeter size was maybe too liberal for inclusion. Even smaller calcifications can have an effect, I would say. So as this technology potentially rolls out into the community as it has, mm -hmm. does it come with specific guidelines regarding calcifications? Uh, yes, yeah. so we, they, um, um, like I don't, uh, so I've only used it in the clinical trial, I haven't used it commercially yet, but um, I may, but it's, um, it just depends on uh, where the Pirates 5 lesion is, uh, how, and how, and people have tried different ways, like positioning the uh, in the within the ten ultrasonic transducers. So we, usually we say to uh, if there, there's a calcification, if it is not in the center of the in trans, um, ultrasonic, uh, there are ten ultrasonic uh, beam generator crystals. So if if they can go around it and if they can angle it around it, it works. But 
Um, so the work, the, there are work truths, but again, none of them has been systematically, it hasn't been systematically studied right now. Um, so uh, people are trying various ways to mitigate that. And then also in the results, the use of pads post-procedure, uh, which was about seven and a half percent, sort of to me seemed like a relatively high number. Is that from the incidental heating of the levators in the sphincter? And is that something that is adjustable? Is it a concern if the tumor is apical and maybe apical lesions are less ideal? Um, so apical, so we, you, we uh, based on the, uh, there was an exclusion criteria for the study that apical lesions, and we always spared the, um, uh, the sphincter at the apex, but, um, and we were very conservative with those lesions, uh, which were at the apex, but, uh, uh around, uh, like 94%, 93 to 94% of the patients, like you said, they did not have, um, usage of pads. Um, so, uh, it's not, so urethra is actively cooled during the um, the procedure, and most of the membranous urethra is obviously also part of the sphincter, which is not indicated. So I don't have a good explanation on why um, even after uh, exclusion. Um, um, uh, so there was only one patient which had more than one pad a day. Around seven percent of patients um, they had a safety pad and um, a, a, a day less than one pad a day. So I, I think it's mostly uh, due to, uh, uh, so the sphincter is actively spare. So we spin, uh, spare it with uh, the MRI thing. So I think it's mostly, uh, the, the leakage is mostly due to uh, maybe uh, just by patient by patient basis. Okay. Like well, we'll, we'll uh, move on, I was just curious. Uh, so next, uh, Abstract two, high food prostate ablation results in a single center community practice, uh, Dr. Mahan. Uh, so thanks for taking the time for sharing this. And um, I was interested in that it looked as if you used a urethral sparing technique. And I was wondering if you could share with us in the course of the procedure, how do you define it? Is it based on you don't treat the zero plane or you don't treat M1 through M2 or P1 through P2? How many lanes do you delete? Do you use a catheter in and out as the you go from anterior to mid to posterior and the urethra is kind of hockey sticking down from anterior to mid prostate as it appears in both those zones? Uh, so if you could just tell us how you nerve spare and then quickly thereafter, how do you think we should establish the normal nadir PSA unlike historic whole gland hyphu, which be, let's say 0.3 or less, clearly in the urethral sparing era, uh, we're coming up with higher mean and median PSAs. Oh, great questions. And uh, I'm honored to be here. And, and I, I know you do a lot of hyphu yourself uh, with the Sonoblite system. And um, what we've done, you know, I've just kind of launched this a couple of years ago and and uh, I trained in Indiana with Mike Cook and, and, and those guys there and brought a lot of that technique with me to Arizona where I'm in private practice. Um, what I do is for a urethral spare, uh, the catheter's in. And when I map it out, you can see the catheter. Um, I go, I leave one lane of uh, uh, tissue untreated um, on each side of the catheter. And I will take it in and out if I want to treat anterior to the catheter or if I'm doing a whole glands and I really want to treat the anterior mid upper tissue. Um, I think I dropped out. I don't know if I, you can see me or not, but uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I remove the catheter during that procedure to treat the, the tissue above the catheter um, and around the catheter, but I'll put it back in at the end when I'm below the catheter. So it's a little bit more uh, hands-on technique um, with the catheter in and out during the procedure. Uh, most of my procedures now are focal therapy um, or hemiablations. Um, uh, those are the candidates that I'm trying to, uh, uh, I think, have the most utility and it's most exciting to, to offer that to patients. And it, in that setting, it's pretty easy. You know, I, I go all the way to the urethra, but again, leave one, one row of Skittles on each side 
Um, so basically you preserve one lane, about three degrees. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, thanks so much. Uh, and we're gonna move on to Dr. Uh, Payne, if I pronounced it correct. I haven't used my French since the 1970s. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, new technology. Those that use HIFU clinically are in dire need of some assistance with the technology so that we can judge dynamically what's going on throughout the case to make sure we're achieving the intended ablation. Do you foresee this technology will be able to use synchronously during an actual uh, thermal ablation instead of a look before and a look after? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, that's that's the the goal of the of the project. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, limited to uh, uh, pre versus post high uh, ablation, but uh, the the computing doesn't take that much time, uh, and we are confident that we will be able to uh, bring it uh, real time uh, soon. And now the the question is, uh, will be we will be able to distinguish uh, a single lesion? individual spots uh, by individual spots, or are we uh, also limited to the whole lesion, to the to the whole uh, lesion in the prostate? That's that's another question that we, we need to answer as well. But the real-time aspect, uh, we are fairly confident uh, to be able to, to bring it to the, to the clinic, yeah. All right, thanks so much, and thanks for your contribution. Uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, that we got an outside question uh, regarding the salvage series, which is abstract four. And the question was, is this actually in the United Kingdom uh, deemed a standard of care for radiation failures? Unfortunately, at the moment, it's not standard of care, although it is available on the NHS. Um, so, in certain centres, primarily those that are closely linked to those providing HIFU and cryotherapy um, or those providing it itself, um, a lot of patients are being told of this option, but it's not widely known about at the moment. Um, and because of that, it's not um, widely taken up, to be perfectly honest, oh, which is were, unfortunate. Primary were, and salvage. There were two... Uh, also, additional outside questions. One was, uh, is just focal therapy in the UK deemed a standard of care? I guess standard of care would be uh, the NICE, uh, you know, acknowledges it as a standard treatment for prostate cancer, that the NHS reimburses for it. And mm -hmm. then the last question from the outside was, how well is it actually accepted clinically? All of us in the rest of the world, you know, see... Uh, your presence in the international academic community, but actually just in the countryside of the UK, is this a commonly accepted procedure? Uh, so there's uh, two very good questions. So NICE does permit the use of focal therapy um, using HIFU or cryotherapy, provided we are collecting data either by trials or in prospectively collected databases, and that's where a lot of this data has come from. Um, so we have multiple centers all diving in together and collaborating, which is one of our strengths. Um, so it is endorsed, but with special um, circumstances. The second part of things is how widely accepted. It's a, it's, it's a very interesting question because um, in the UK, geographically, we have very different demographics of patients as well. So what we're finding is there are some very motivated um, patients that are educating themselves about um, treatment coming to us specific, even though there are relatively few centres providing the treatment. So we have some patients that are very accepting of it. Um, we have some patients that are less so because it's newer than um, radiotherapy and prostatectomy. But what we are doing in the UK is running a clinical trial. At the moment, it's in a pilot basis called Kronos. And what that's looking to do is understanding how acceptable focal therapy is against the radical treatments as well. So hopefully some genuine, strong answers to uh, come in the future. All right, and then uh, the next questions kind of roll into the fifth abstract, the cancer control outcomes following focal therapy in the nearly 1,800 men with non-metastatic disease. So just sort of a testament 
to the body of work everybody in the UK has done. And uh, I've spent more than my share of time at bars with drinks with Ash and Mark, uh, trying to hash out my differences and approach. So mm -hmm. if you could just sort of uh, answer a couple of these questions, uh, in the UK, as opposed to my side of the Atlantic Ocean, a second treatment is not a failure in the UK. I would argue in the US, uh, it's a, considered a failure. If you do yeah. anything first requiring any second treatment, that is a failure of the first treatment. And I think one of the differences in the US is people who have persistent disease in field or out of field after HIFU commonly move on to a different treatment. A, ra a robotic prostatectomy, radiation, they don't have the second HIFU. And it makes it challenging to interpret results because since we can't use PSA for focal therapy, we use the FFS. Well, on your side of the ocean, a second treatment would not be a failure and would be FFS negative. On yes. my side of the ocean, if they have any persistence and they go on to a whole gland therapy, they are now, by your own definition, a failure. Yes. So it becomes important to try to minimize local persistence in field and out of field. Yes. When you look at your second treatments, how many of the people who move on to whole gland therapy failed at the site of the second treatment? Meaning Ooh. what's the efficacy of the second treatment? So that's question okay. one. Question two is, if you took all your focals and hemis and hockey sticked them, how many of the out of field failures would have gone away because you treated them the first time? Sure. So there's quite a lot. To <laughs> well, I've got 15 years of questions filled up. And Mark. So, <laughs> so um, what we are doing is working on um, developing a paper for this. So, what we have looked at is the recurrence rates for these patients. So we've seen about a quarter of patients after their first um, primary HIFU have three plus four disease or more. So that's led to about 18% of patients having any form of retreatment. Um, the majority have one further focal therapy session. Um, so that's about, in this cohort, about 200 patients had repeat focal therapy and then nothing else. Um, when we're looking at whole gland, either prostatectomy or radiation therapy, we've got about 80 or 90 patients out of that whole cohort going for whole gland treatment. Okay, so, sorry, I know there's a lot of information, but I need to yeah. honor the other people and they're yeah. holding us to time. So I'll okay. catch you another time for that. So let's move to Dr. Shade and Abstract 7. And uh, fascinating, you know, uh, you're not going to have an answer, but while we do traditional HIFU, we are looking for acoustic bubbling which could contribute to the mechanical disruption and part of the efficacy of the treatment. I've never seen an article saying people who have higher Yoshida Papakuan scores have less disease recurrence, but do you have any uh, other thoughts as what the advantages of histotripsy would be versus a technology that's using both mechanical and thermal effects? Yeah, I think very briefly, the, the answer is the, the feedback on ablation. So since you lose the scatters from mechanical ablation, you have a quantit potentially quantitative way of measuring the efficacy of the ablation. Oh, God. And uh, we're going to jump to abstract nine. I don't believe abstract eight author had shown up. So Dr. Hertzberg, could you just let us know how this or when this could transition into clinical use since, once again, the ability to identify what's going on with the HIFU energy while we're working uh, would be an extraordinary technological addition to our therapy. Thank you. Um, currently, we are doing animal, experiment, animal experiments and we plan to, to start human twi clinical trials in about one and a half years. All right. Well, thanks to all the participants. I think uh, pretty soon they're going to be wrapping us up.